So about a month ago, when Daryl was working on the preaching schedule, the calendar of how we'd be approaching all these different topics in the Ask Belmar series, we decided, let's give me something a little less complicated, something not nearly as intense as these things we've, he's been uh, preaching on. So we'll take a look at today's question. Can we sing Christian rap songs for Sunday morning worship? Why or why not? Well, I'll tell you what, I am so glad there has never been anyone in the history of the church that's had a strong opinion about the songs we sing in church. <laughs> I mean, oh my gosh. But no, seriousness, I love this question. I love this question because it's about one of the single most important aspects of the believer's life. And it's worship. You see, I believe worship is to the believer, to the follower of Christ, what water is to a fish. You know, we kind of need it to survive every single day. But when we talk about worship in the church, sometimes things get a little bit more complicated. So before I go there, I want to share a story of two years ago about a decision I made that I think every man has the opportunity to make at some point in their life. So I was with my wife, Mary Ann. We're over at, um, I think it's Northfield, and we're going to Bass Pro Shop just to look around. And so we're, we're walking through and we're kind of going upstairs and stuff and we get to the bow hunting section. And I'm sure some of you guys out there, you felt this before, this like, this deep, instinct, carnal, caveman-like nature, like roaring up at me. And it sounded like this. It said, gosh dang it, Scott, you're 24 years old now and you're a man and you need to learn how to hunt and kill stuff. <laughs> and I was like, yes. So I looked at my beautiful wife and I said, woman, I'm buying a bow and I'm going to learn to hunt and kill stuff and I'm going to save so much money on food or something like that's how it went. And, uh, and wives, if you ever heard your husband say something out of their mind, ridiculous, you kind of know this look she gave me. It was kind of this like half eye roll, half like thinking to herself, how in the world did this fool get me to fall in love with him? <laughs> and, and so we bought the bow, but we didn't just buy the bow. Oh no, no, no. I had to have all the right equipment. I mean, I was getting like camo pants, camo shirt, camo hat. Like I needed it all. I needed to have all the right gear. But there was one tiny problem. I lived in an apartment. And that apartment was in Highlands Ranch at the time. And there's no public park I know of that would let me just set up a little fake deer and just start shooting bows at it in the middle of the public park. So I didn't really get to practice that much. And... Never really learned to hunt, but I knew all the right gear. I mean, I knew about bow technology. I knew about the strings, knew about the arrow fletching, the little um, honey biscuit, what's that thing called? Whisker biscuit. Someone hunts out here, you probably know. I think it's called a whisker biscuit where the arrow shoots through. Anyway, it holds it. And uh, I knew all this stuff, but I never actually went hunting. And, I'm, and I feel like sometimes in church, we kind of we, we focus so much on, on like the, the how of worship. You know, we, we're trying to make sure we have just the right lighting or just the right um, music sound or just the right, like maybe, maybe you have to have your hands up or maybe you have to have them down, you know? Or maybe you got to have like just a little bit of a sway, not too much because you start dancing, you know, people start looking and they start talking. You know, you have, to have, you have to do all these things just the right way. You got to play just the right songs. You got to have just the right instruments, don't be putting any like unholy, sinful instruments on stage. We focus, see I'm concerned that we focus so much on how we worship that we ignore who we worship. And I, and, and I don't want us to, to feel guilty about feeling maybe misguided in our worship. That's not the direction I want us to go at all. I want us to be starving for the fullness and the, of the presence of God in our worship and the effects of biblical worship on our lives. That's where I want us to go. And so, um, if you're looking at your notes, you probably see a couple words that don't make any sense to you and look like baby sounds, right? Um, let's go ahead and take a look at Genesis 22. We're going to look at what I believe is a pretty accurate definition of biblical worship. We're going to look at it almost completely literally. And so Genesis 22.5, we catch up with the story of Abraham. He's about to have his faith tested uh, and obedience. And so, here's what I want you all to see. Just a small snippet. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy, it was his son Isaac, 
I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. So they're, they're going to go over here. They're going to go worship. Pretty, I'm almost certain, no matter what translation you have today, it should use the word worship. That word is pretty easy to translate. In the Hebrew, it comes from the word shaka. So that's what you see on there, all those funny looking little cartoon looking letters and stuff. That's Hebrew. The funny pronunciation, that's how you say it, shaka. And shaka basically meant, it was, this, it was like this reflexive verb, which means you did something, but also that something happened to you. So what it meant was they would actually go over here and in their worship, they weren't busting out, you know, their Chris Tomlin track or their devotional. They would have like pretty much laid down on the ground, lowering themselves before God. And so we begin to see that this shaka implies this, this lowering of one's self. I want to look at another example. We're going to flip all the way over to the New Testament. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 2. So this one's really fun too. Um, Matthew chapter 2 verse 11. And we're catching up here with the wise men thinking uh, Christmas time, right? The wise men are coming to see baby Jesus. And here's what happens. And going into the house, they, the wise men, saw the child with Mary and his mother. And they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I cannot wait for Christmas, y'all. This is this awesome. I can't do it yet though, right? You see, what's happening here is this word, the New Testament was written in Greek. And this word is proskaneo. If you want to sound fancy, you can like proskaneo or something like that. But proskaneo. And that's actually a Greek, it's actually two Greek words. Pros and kaneo. Pros meant like towards, kaneo like to kiss. So it was this idea of this, this kissing towards. Because here's, there's this cultural practice, kind of like how we do like, what's up, playa? High five. You know, like they high five each other, that kind of stuff. Except here's what they did. When you were greeting someone of equal stature, you would share a kiss on the lips if you're about the same level, same stature in society. If someone was a little bit lower in stature than you, say like a, like a student to a teacher, they would, they would kiss on the cheek. But if there was this, this massive gap between you and this person you were greeting, this huge gulf between the two of you in stature, then you would, you would barely come down to their feet and kiss their feet. And that's the proskaneo. That's what the biblical authors were referring to. This, it even says they fell down in worship. Like, they come up to baby Jesus. I mean, literally, it would have looked a lot like, what's up, baby Jesus? Like, right here. And it's... It's so counterintuitive. Here in America, we, we think of submission as a weakness. I mean, consider two wrestlers. The one who submits is the one who loses. But we, we need a, re, a rewiring of what submission means. See, with, with God, submission is saying, God, I surrender control. I surrender the decision-making. Lead me. And through that, we grow in holiness. We grow in righteousness. We see all these effects because we're allowing God to, con to control us and to lead us. Basically meaning like the believer who is wholeheartedly submitted to God isn't going to be acting out in, in self-centeredness. They're not going to be pursuing um, a violence or abuse. Or, they're not going to be going after these things because God is leading them. You see, do you know why, like, there's, there's hate, and there's, there's evil, and there's this, this racism, there's, there's so much viciousness, and murder, and violence? You know why that exists in the world? It's because it's sin. It's sin in this world. We're in this fallen place. And if, if you're here today, and you're feeling tired, you know, I don't mean like the tired, like your 11-month-old daughter was up all night crying. You know, I've, I've been there too. That's hard. But I mean like, like you're tired of, you're tired of life. You're tired of the, un, the injustice, the unfairness, the evil, the hatred, all of these things. Guys, that is the product of sin. That's what's happening. That's what happens when we lead our lives, when we let God have control, when we've submitted to God. He will not lead us into sin. Just the opposite. Worship is submitting to God. You see, sin says, I am God. Or at least you want to be like him. I mean, 
Don't you remember the, the, the if, if you've never heard this before, it's going to blow your mind. In Genesis 3, 5, Satan, the deceiver, said to Eve these words. No, eat the fruit. It, it, surely it won't kill you. It'll open your eyes and you'll be like God. And what was the sin of Satan? He wanted to be God. You see, we want all the power. We want all the decision-making. We want all of the control. Submission says, lie down at the feet of God. We want to be God. That's the basis of sin. Submission, worship, is the exact opposite. I mean, I'm, I'm, like when you lay down, you're kind of vulnerable. People could step on you. And see, there's only, there's only one person who ever lived his life in perfect worship. And there's one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. And that's Jesus Christ. But before we get there, I want to take a look. We're going to move on to a, with the object of worship. So we're going to spend a little more time in Luke chapter 7. So if you do want to flip over there, you can. Otherwise, uh, we're going to have it all coming up on the screen in a bit. So Luke chapter 7, verse 36. This is a really cool story. Jesus is going into this Pharisee's house and they're hanging out. They're, they're having dinner. They're having supper. Here's what happens. One of the Pharisees asked him, Jesus, to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner. So everyone knows sinful woman here. When she learned that he, Jesus, was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. See, what's really powerful to me here is we see such a beautiful demonstration of worship. See, first there's Jesus and she approaches him and she's standing behind him and she's crying. We're not, we're not quite sure yet why She's crying, but she's standing there. And the next thing, in the next verse, we see that she's actually, now she's kneeling before him. I mean, her hair would have been long, but she would have had to kneel to wipe his feet with her hair. And what's the next thing you see? She's down at her face, kissing his feet. She's completely postured herself into submission before Jesus. It's beautiful, y'all. She doesn't even care what anyone else thinks. You see, most of the women wore these coverings, or at the least, they had their hair tied up in this cool little basket thing. And she let it all down, and she knelt down to wipe. It would have been scandalous enough that she would be seen next to a prophet like Jesus. She's a woman of the city, a sinner. I mean, let's take a look at the next verse. Obviously, the judgment was coming very quickly. Verse 39, now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known what sort of woman this is who is touching him. Here's that, here's that sting, right? For she is a sinner. As if he's not, right? We've all felt that pain of judgment too. Sometimes we just, man, we get so excited to worship, we just want to do something. We're like, what if, what if someone sees me? You know, that wasn't, that wasn't in her mindset at all. Her focus was completely on Jesus saying, whatever. I love you. Nothing else matters right now. And she expressed it so beautifully, y'all. You see, because worship is all about God. Worship is all about God. It's not about our preferences. It's not, even the music really isn't even for us. We sing to God. I mean, I'll tell you what, it is beautiful though here and everyone's voices together. That ministers to me too. I'm like, man, all these other people believe in Jesus and they love him too. That's awesome. That, mean, that means a lot to me too. That's that horizontal stuff. But our songs, we're singing them to God. We're singing them to Jesus. That is completely vertical. And so when we have God as the focal piece of our worship, I tell you what, you can worship anywhere. I could, when, when God is the only thing that matters in my submission saying, God, whatever you want with my life, you can do it. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what I'm hearing. I can be in um, Mountain View Baptist Church in, uh, where is that church? Um, Walden, Colorado, 15 people singing Crown Him with Many, Many Crowns. Great song. 
I can be singing Oceans at a Hillsong United concert with 15,000 people. I still love Jesus there too. My God does not change because of the beat of a song. God is the same. I mean, whether you got an electric guitar or you got a harp, y'all. Because it's, it's, not, it's not about us. Yes, I tell you what, when you're, when you're worshiping powerful, when you're feeling you got your hands up or you're sitting down just praying and you're like, man, God, I mean, you can feel it. You can feel it because we're made to worship. I tell you what, we are made to worship. But that worship is to God. It's to say, you are great. I'm down here. But he does something unthinkable. He raises us up. Before I get there, I want y'all to look at this next part. Jesus, I don't know if y'all, this is kind of a fun thing. This is for free, y'all. So the guy said this in his head. If Jesus knew, and then Jesus says, Jesus answered him. Like, Jesus knows the guy's thoughts. Like, that's crazy. I've read over that so many times. But the guy's like, hmm, if Jesus knew what this woman was, then, you know. He's, and he's like, I heard what you were thinking. Well, I'm going to answer the question for you. And the guy's, I mean, people are like, what? Like, that's crazy. It's so easy to read over that. Jesus can read your mind. But here's what he says. He gives him this parable, this little teaching story. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And Jesus says to him, you have judged rightly. See, there's this, this humility that is so important in worship. I believe the woman who came to Jesus recognized her sin. She knew how broken she was. There's this quote I want to read it to y'all from a book I read about worship uh, a couple years ago. I love it so much. So I'm going to read this to y'all. It's not from me. I'm not, I'm not this smart. This guy's good. Jesus explains to Simon the reason for her love and gratitude forgiveness. Like the one who owed much and found himself released from debt, she had been forgiven much. Nowhere in this passage is the word worship used. Nevertheless, Jesus accepted what we should hope to bring in worship, devoted love and overwhelming gratitude. See, she knew the depth and the depravity and the brokenness of her sin. And when Jesus said, your sins are forgiven, verse 47, therefore I tell you her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but he was forgiven little, loves little. When she realized how much had been forgiven, the, the depth of that great debt, the debt that she owed was forgiven, man, she was overwhelmed. I can't help it. When I'm, when I'm singing to God, I can't help but think how how unfair it is that I get to live and Jesus had to die. I, I can't think, I, I, I think of how unfair it is how many times I've turned my back to him and I've rejected him. I've chosen my own desires over God. I've sinned and yet he still loves me like a hurricane is what that law song said. That's powerful. People evacuate. They run away from hurricanes. God is powerful. His love is powerful. See, if you're in the middle of the ocean and you're, you're sinking, you're thinking, this is it, I'm going to die if I don't get any help. And then on the horizon, you see a, a little tugboat, you know, coming. That's a train. I don't know what boats do. <laughs> the boat's coming, you know. And they throw out a little life preserver to you. You grab hold of it and they're pulling you in. I mean, you're like, thank you. Oh my, I mean, you love everyone in there. You're so happy to all of them because you know how much trouble you were in. You know you're going to die. I mean, if you're in the kiddie pool of sin and someone saves you, yeah, it's not going to be that big a deal. You haven't done much. You didn't really need to be helped. You probably could have fixed it yourself. I could stop whenever I want. But if you're in the Pacific Ocean of sin and you know how broken you are, how messed up you are, how lost you are without Jesus Christ, man, do you love the person that comes to rescue you. Because you know how like up a river you are. You know how lost you are, how hopeless you are without Jesus. See, the, the key ingredient to healthy worship is that humility. 
This is what makes a submission possible. For saying, well, how do I even submit to God? You have to be willing to say, I need his help. You see, our God is, is perfect. Our God is, is flawless. He loves you. He's strong. And he knows what's best for you. And when you believe in that, when you trust in that, you let him take control. You see, our God will never fail you. Our God will never leave you. Our God will never forsake you. Our God is a mighty refuge. Our God is a mighty fortress. He will work in your life. The English uh, preacher, Charles Spurgeon, used to say frequently, I have a great need for Jesus Christ, and I have a great Christ for my need. He was a, like, he must have known that humility. I want to be there. I want to know that intimacy with God. In Corinthians 10.31, we're reminded that whatever we do, we do it all for the glory of God. What's really cool about this is it liberates us. Worship doesn't just happen on Sunday morning from 11 to 11.24. We can worship God in every single thing we do because we're submitting all of our responsibilities to God. In every single thing we do, we're seeking to glorify God and make the name of Jesus famous. So this is one of the questions I think we can ask ourselves right now. What exactly does it look like to have an attitude of worship? So we're going to look at two examples really fast. Philippians 2, 8 will be our first verse. And I got to see if I can get over there. And you know, we're going to move quick. So if you want to flip there. Blah, blah, blah. Um, this is Paul writing about Jesus. And being found in human form, he, Jesus, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus humbled himself. There's this one song I love. It says, you traded heaven to have me again. It's this little lyric. It says, I sold my life. I sold my soul for pleasures of the earth. But Jesus, you traded heaven to have me back again. Like Jesus had everything and surrendered that, humbled himself, was so obedient to his father God that he went to a cross and died in your place for your sin, for our sin. That is powerful. Humility says, God, I need your help. Show me the way, which yields obedience, which says, God, I'm going to follow you because I know you got the best way possible. And Jesus followed it to death on a cross. One more example, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4. We look at 6 through 7. Timothy uh, is like the young protege, the student of Paul, this great guy who wrote all these cool things. And this is what he says. It's kind of toward the end of his life a little bit. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. See, the funny thing about a drink offering, they have different types of offerings. A drink offering, when I mean, you pour it out and offer it to God, and once you pour it out, you can't get that liquid back into the container. It's spilt in an offering to God. Everything is given up. There's this general uh, named Hannibal who was coming to fight the Roman Empire. And when he, when he came upon the beach where they brought all their ships, they had to cross over this mountain thing. Or I, I think it was either the mountain, that was the elephants. Before that, he had this big, there was, the battle was going to happen right over there. He tells all the men, grab torches. Let's burn the boats. They're like, what? what, what? That's how we're going to get back. He's like, no. The only way you get back is when you kill the enemy in front of you. There is no backup plan. You fight, you win, or you die. You're not going back. Paul has such, like, oh my gosh. I, I always say, I want to die tired. I want to have given everything I have. I want my life to be like a drink offering to God. I want to be poured out. I want to hold nothing back. Because you can't tell anybody about Jesus in heaven, y'all. Like everyone knows. But you can do it here. And I want to do it as much as I possibly can. I want to be poured out. I want to be spilt out. You see, and agreed, most of us aren't, aren't going to die on a cross. Many of us are not going to travel the world to share the gospel. And so we wonder, how, how then does it look to actually submit to God in, in daily life? And so I think sometimes we can... We can hyper-spiritualize things a little bit because don't hear me saying that you need to quit your job and you, we all need to be like monks in a monastery and just live there praising God. That's not what I'm saying at all. 
Remember 1 Corinthians 10 31 said, whatever you do, bring glory to God, right? And so if you're, if you're like an accountant and you're, you're sitting in a cubicle for 40 hours a day, you know, you're typing away at numbers, then let your worship be accuracy and integrity. If you're um, a, uh, a part-time janitor cleaning school bathrooms, then let your worship be excellence and honesty. Make those bathrooms shine, y'all. If you're a, a teacher working at a, like a, child, a child's daycare, then let your worship be shining bright the love of Jesus to these most precious little ones. Maybe you're just in seventh grade and the hardest thing you have is remembering to pick up your socks and turn in your homework. Then let your worship be love and honor for your parents and make that room look spotless, right? We can honor God in everything we do. Our worship is our submission saying, God, lead me. Show me the way. And it doesn't stop when, when we finish praying and we do the, it doesn't stop there. We continue I, I pray that this morning is just a continuation of your worship throughout the rest of the week. Maybe it's an extra recharge because you had a rough one. But it, it's, it's just continuing on. So this last thing I want to talk about is I want to share a story about this city in 1905. This man by the name of Wilbur Chapman spent just a few days just sharing the gospel. It was kind of like an old-fashioned tent revival kind of thing. Like, went to this big building, all these people showed, like thousands of people came. I mean, they even shut down the city for a couple hours so everyone could come to this big revival. Thousands of people were converted. In fact, I actually have a video um, I want you all to watch about this. And pay attention to the details. You might recognize the city. In case you didn't catch it, this is Denver, Colorado. 2,000 people were saved. 1905, Denver, Colorado. I want to read y'all uh, something this reporter wrote, and you'll see it behind me too. For two hours at midday, all Denver was held in a spell. The marts of trade were deserted between noon and two o'clock this afternoon, and all worldly affairs were forgotten, and the entire city was given over to meditation of higher things. The spirit of Almighty pervaded every nook. Going to and coming from the great meetings, the thousands of men and women radiated the spirit which filled them. And the clear Colorado sunshine was made brighter by the reflected glow of the light of God shining from happy faces. Seldom has such a remarkable sight been witnessed. An entire city in the middle of a busy week bowing before the throne of heaven and asking and receiving the blessing of the king of the universe. Guys, that is here. I, des I, I, I never want to leave Colorado because there is so much work to be done and I want to be a part of it, y'all. I want to be a part of what God's doing in our city. God is at work in Belmar. God is at work in Lakewood. He is at work in the city. You just need to join him. See, every major revival or, or great spiritual awakening was always preceded with prayer. Because prayer is like the most pure, like wholehearted attempt at submitting yourself to God. The reason you pray is because you need help. You're saying, God, I can't do it. I need your help. That's powerful. We're praying, we're petitioning, we're saying, God, come and show up. Do your will in this place. 
That's our worship. See, worship's a complete submission before God. It's proskuneo. It's laying down at the feet in complete surrender. Worship is realizing the great gulf between Jesus and you and saying, oh my gosh, I love you. I am so undeserving. And Jesus says, when, or the Bible says, when you are humbled before God, he will exalt you. When you humble yourself before God, he lifts you up. It's insane. We don't deserve it, yet we get to know the King of Kings. Y'all, I've said this before. It's a spiritual rags to riches kind of story. So many people, especially in our city, are, are spiritually broken. They're impoverished. And yet we, for whatever reason, I'm no one special. I can't think of anything cool I've done. There's guys my age tonight going to be catching like amazing passes in the end zone after the Broncos win. And um, I haven't done anything that awesome. But yet God's like, I'm going to reveal myself to you and you're going to know truth and hope and salvation and you're going to know my power and I want to use you. It begins with humility when we submit to God. Whether we're singing that hymn or that rap song, I like some of the Christian rap too, it's good. Submit yourself to God and you can worship in any circumstance. You can go across the country. They can sing a language you understand, but you know they're saying Jesus because you hear it, Jesus. You're like, that's my God, that's my Jesus. Use me, Lord. I, I am nothing compared to you. But yet, you see me as everything. How beautiful is that? And so, my prayer is when we understand biblical worship, that we don't, we don't let it be contained to just Sunday morning. Like unleash it, church. Unleash it into every aspect of your life. Let it permeate, let it infect every single thing you do. Jesus described the kingdom of heaven like yeast that's worked into flour that spreads throughout the dough. Guys, it's not like here's the corporate world, here's the nonprofit world, here's the church world. No, like the church is supposed to be part of everything. That's why it's so great that we're not all preachers. We need accountants. We need babysitters. We need teachers. We need truck drivers. We need all these things because you take the gospel to places some of us will never get into. We're like the germs. We're infecting the world with Jesus. Let's start coughing up. Not, don't cough on people for real, but you know, share the gospel. That's the power of biblical worship. It's gonna spread and it's gonna go through, your, through every part of your life, guys. And I promise you, God meets you where you're at. And James, he says, draw near to the Lord and I will draw near to you. What a promise. What a promise. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for your truth and, and, and making worship a place where we can just come to your throne, come before your altar and just let everything be revealed. And you love us still because of your great grace. Father, even if, we, even if we came up here and put on the best music show ever, would we be any different than a rock concert or the Denver Symphony? God, we need your spirit here. We submit to you. Just recognizing you're powerful isn't enough. The verb shaka, the verb proskuneo, it's reflexive. God, we humble ourselves in response to your greatness. Father, let this be true in our life. Let this just be like that germ. Let us be like that yeast that infects everything in our life. Let not a single person in our household not know the name of Jesus Christ. They will know his name. Maybe, they don't, maybe they're not there yet, God. We trust you with that, but they will know his name. Father, thank you so much for your truth, for your word, and for using us, these, these humble servants. In Jesus' name, amen.